It's an honor to, to be here. Um, I think um, what I will try and address uh, a little bit is we, we've just heard from, from the global young scientists how, how they see the future of science, what young scientists would like to do, and I think that's all great and, and really worthy, and I'm sure most of us support that. What I will talk about more is actually the situation for young scientists and the reality and what we perhaps have to do at a policy level to support young scientists to, to realize these ambitions. I'm from the Global Science Forum, which is a, a forum that brings together ministries from OS, science ministries from OECD countries. Um, and one of the issues they're concerned about is the future of young scientists. Um, so just quickly, this is what I will go through, just in, in case you get lost during the presentation. I, I, won't, I won't read it out. Um, so what are young researchers calling for? I'll skip over this because we've just, we've just heard this um, from, the, um, from the GYA. Um, there was an earlier statement from GIA that came out recently as well, which I think is also important, and, and that is more, perhaps, if you like, about applied science or the application of science. Um, but again, the issues that they highlight are interdisciplinarity, social interest, well-being, ethical research behavior, and equity, which I think is an important issue, um, public communication. Um, and the in science influencing policy making and solving shared challenges. I think many of these issues are perhaps not what we traditionally would associate with basic research. Um, and I think it's interesting that the, the, the GYA is moving basic research more explicitly uh, into the, the realm of application, addressing global challenges, communication, etc. We've just heard about this one, and I, I'll skip this, but many of those same issues come, come through. So where are, what is the situation for young researchers at the moment? Um, in the Global Science Forum, we've, we've done several pieces of work on this, looking at uh, skills, digital skills, transdisciplinary research, etc. Um, what I'll focus on here is two recent reports, one looking at precarity in research, and particularly the situation for postdocs, and then another looking at alternative career paths. Uh, and we're currently doing work on equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, these reports, um, this is a scientific audience, so how did we put these together? How did we come to these conclusions? Uh, it's sort of summarized here, so they were internationally... Um, overseen, if you like. Uh, we looked at st the stats and policy information that we have at OECD, which is a lot. We collect a lot from countries of what are they currently doing with young researchers. Uh, we looked at the literature, etc. cetera. Um, importantly, because there's actually a shortage of data on the career paths for young researchers and what is happening to them. So we collected a lot of de novo information from countries um, and we did a lot of interviews with, with young researchers, with PIs, with, uh, with policy makers, etc. So the big picture, what is the situation? Um, in terms of supply, this is looking at OECD countries. What, what you see, uh, the blue bar, if you like, is 2019, and the, the diamond uh, shows the situation just five years earlier. Uh, and in five years, we've seen an increase of about 25% in the number of PhDs in the general population. In virtually all OECD countries, we're producing a lot more PhDs than we used to. What do these PhDs want to do? Most of them want to stay in academia. Uh, this is from a nature survey in 2019. There's actually been more recent survey that shows that these numbers are even higher. And where do they actually end up? Um, in most countries, a minority of them are actually employed in academic research in the long term. Uh, in many countries, if we take Switzerland and Germany, which I think we consider as having pretty strong um, research enterprises, um, we're looking at 20% of the PhD students actually end up in academia. Um, 
And what are the conditions for those who are in academia? If we look here, the important part is the, the light blue bar. Um, those are the ones who have precarious... Um, sorry, those are the ones who have fixed-term positions. So all the others are in precarious positions. This was from a survey of um, corresponding authors under the age of 45. Um, so I think there were about 6,000 authors responded to this. So these are... These are leaders, if you like. These are the people who are publishing under the age of 45. And in many countries, and in the majority of countries, most of them are on short-term positions, precarious positions. So what about precarity? Um, there's been a lot of studies now on precarity. It's bec there's more and more awareness around, about it. Here's some of the issues that, that uh, we see because of precarity. Uh, the well-being, the effect on individuals can, can be really negative, uh, including serious mental health issues. If we look at the suicide levels in uh, postdocs, it's actually much higher than, than in the general population. Um, because of the precarity, certain populations are choosing not to go into research. So we're, policymakers are making a lot of effort to try and diversify the research population, to attract those from the underrepresented groups, including women, into research. And precarity is one of the things that really uh, makes it unattractive to many of those groups. Um, and it also affects the research choices. So people choose to do safe research rather than take risks because they have to have the publications to have any chance of getting a, a permanent position. Um, just some of the different perspectives on precarity, and I'll just flash these up quickly and you can read them. So coming from the funders, uh, as I say, I won't read these out. The employers. Um, coming from the researchers themselves, I think this is important. Um, the mental health problems, uh, the issues for, for females in particular, issues around international, and then from policymakers, um, I think it's interesting that there's no problem with unemployment, and this is true in the longer term. Most PhDs end up in, in jobs um, compared with the general population. They even earn slightly more in the longer term. Uh, the, the issue really is what happens to them when they're in the academic research enterprise. It's complicated precarity, and there are many different challenges and causes. Um, so um, we have this sort of permadoc phenomenon. Uh, it's partly to do with the funding mechanisms, with, with project grants, etc. But people do repeated postdocs. Um, the career structures are, are very linear, um, and, and there's little possibility to switch from one stream to another. The postdoctoral phase itself is really unstructured. Uh, people are expected also to, to travel during that period. Um, and it's a dependency of, of young researchers on the principal investigators, which sometimes, depending on your PI or, or mentor, can be a very good experience. In many cases, uh, it's problematic. Uh, the lack of diversity, the late selection for permanent positions, a lack of intersectoral mobility, moving from one field of research to another, from research into the public sector or private sector, and trying to move back afterwards, which is almost impossible. Um, Kerr responsibilities and the weight of that falls particularly on women. International mobility, um, I say the expectation is that postdocs travel. For many, that is really a good experience, but then there are issues about losing your social networks, if you want to come back home, and also in many countries there are issues of discrimination in terms of the conditions for those who, who come from abroad compared with those who are at home. And that can work either way. Um, human resource management, particularly for postdocs, is poor. Um, and the end of that is that people are voting with, the, with their feet, they're not going into research, and we hear that more and more, that the best people are choosing not to go into academia. 
And yet for all of this, we also have a very poor evidence base in terms of comparative statistics across countries, etc., which is one of the reasons why little action has really been taken in this area. Um, this report came up with nine policy recommendations. Um, I'll go into the first of these because this is perhaps the, the most interesting for, um, for the young researchers, the working conditions. Um, I won't, I won't read through these, but you can see them. I'll come back to some of them uh, afterwards. Going back to the working conditions, what are the sort of things that, that can be done to improve, improve working conditions? And these are based on things that some countries are already doing, some actions that are taking place at the uh, policy level. Um, employment contracts as opposed to stipends. Of course, it, it depends on the context, it depends on the countries, but we see that several countries now have shifted from stipends to employment contracts, and uh, actually it's no longer uh, allowed to, to do a PhD, or certainly a postdoc, uh, without having a proper employment contract. Career frameworks. Um, include the postdocs in the career frameworks. Postdocs are kind of... They're on their own. No one takes responsibility for them. There's a lot of attention or increasing attention now to PhD students or PhD researchers, but postdocs, uh, they're not going to stay long. They're going to move on. The, the, the universities uh, don't necessarily take responsibility for them. They're on their own. They're a sort of mercenary workforce, and yet um, the whole scientific research enterprise depends on them. They are le d'oeuvre of research. Um, what are the career prospects? What can they do outside academia? Many of them finish up outside academia, the majority in many countries. Um, and yet we, we rarely talk about that, and it's difficult for them to find the information. Um, fixed term contracts. Um, instead of giving repeated one-year contracts, can we have a minimum uh, in terms of fixed term contracts? Um, think about open-ended positions. Um, and then monitor their working conditions and employment status. Um, so this issue of evidence, what is really happening to them. So having done this work on precarity and realizing that most PhDs don't end up in academia, um, how can we promote diverse career paths for them? How can we make sure that when they are in academia, when they are doing research in, in the public sector, that they're satisfied, that they're happy, that they're productive, and that they can see a way forward uh, um, that is simple, that is clear. Um, so this work, um, looking at career paths, we came up with eight policy recommendations on this. Um, engaging employers outside of academia um, the institutions responsible for research need to engage employers outside academia and the different ways of doing that. Um, experience and skills that, that are needed for, for careers outside of academic research. Um, can we promote those with, within the, uh, the training that the PhDs and postdocs have? How can we valorize a PhD? How can we promote that to to industry and to, to other um, employers, to the public sector, etc. What we hear in many countries when we talk to other potential employers is, oh, well, actually, PhDs, you know, they're, they're too single-minded. They, and they don't have the, the sort of general soft skills, the communication skills, etc., that we want. Um, career guidance, simple. How, how do we provide career, career guidance other than what... Um, your principal investigator and um, your, your, sort of your, your guide necessarily knows. What we find is that many of the, the mentors for PhD students, they've always been in academia. They're very good academic researchers, but they don't know any other future. And, and so it's hard for them to give guidance on that. Intersectoral mobility, how can we promote that with the business sector? And there are many different ways, of, you know, uh, jointly funded PhDs, periods in, in industry, etc. Uh, intersectoral mobility with the public sector. Um, what we see is that PhDs in social sciences often end up in the public sector, whereas those in the hard sciences, if you like, would, would go more towards the private sector. 
But we also need the inverse. Increasingly in the public sector, people are, the, what we hear is that we need, need experts in, in different areas of hard science and in industry they're saying we need social sciences. How can we promote those things? Um, reconfiguring the research career for those in academia, and I'll come back to that, um, and supporting international mobility in, in a way that it, that it is all the positive that we know at the moment to maintain, but also we remove some of the, some of the problems, some of the um, biases in that. So when we come to, to reconfiguring uh, careers in academic research, um, as I said earlier on, what we see at the moment is a sort of a, a one-track linear path, um, and uh, there are examples where, where this is changing. Um, there are national forums in some countries in, in which young researchers are engaged um, in discussing the, the, the careers, the, the rewards, the incentives for, for what they do and how they could be changed. Um, there are concordats that maybe a, a lot of them are soft law, but increasingly they are becoming uh, accepted and they are having more and more influence. Um, Inclusion, diversity, and equity uh, initiatives. Um, we're, as I say we're working on that now. There are, there are many different initiatives taking place, particularly with a focus on, on women, on gender, and many of those are starting to show results. But what we see, for example, when we look at uh, social status, what we see is effectively uh, an academic uh, research career is almost hereditary. It's very hard for a first-generation person for someone to be the first generation in their family to, to actually go into an academic career, to do a PhD and continue. Um, and we're missing out on a lot of talent because of that. Um, and then academic reward systems, evaluation systems, the incentives, the, the focus on bibliometrics at, at the expense of everything else. And this comes back to what we heard from the, the young scientists at the start. We didn't, in all of that statement, we didn't see anything about more um, highly cited publications. It's about communication, interdisciplinarity, serving society, basic science for good. Um, can we measure all of that in publications? If we look, for example, at what science did in relation to COVID and the role of scientists in relation to COVID, how are we going to evaluate that? Just those who published in Nature and Science? Or what about those who spent all their time making their data available, or developing the models, or talking to policymakers, or communicating to the public? How do we evaluate that? How do we incentivize that so that we have more of that? Um, international mobility, again, a, a critical issue, I think, in, in this audience, and particularly here at CERN. Um, how do we support both the outcoming and incoming researchers so that, so that we really end up with, with brain flow as opposed to net gains and losses? Um, how do we attract researchers back to countries where, where they originate? Uh, um, again, this, this issue of uh, net gains and, and losses. Um, a level playing field between national researchers and, um, and those coming from abroad. And then technical issues like pension rights, and of course the, the Commission has done a lot on this recently. So the key takeaways from this, um, we need systemic changes within the academic system if we're going to deliver what we heard at the start from the global young scientists. Um, we need to promote and valorize different career options. It shouldn't be failure uh, there shouldn't be a stigma associated with not continuing in academia. In fact, it should be seen as a positive thing. We should be able to recruit people as PhD students and postdocs who at the outset say, I don't want to do an academic career. I want to train in science and, and use it for other things. Um, in most cases, that's not the way we select people at the moment. Uh, universities and the research providers Places like CERN are, are really critical in this because uh, they are the employers. Um, but then the policy community and the funders um, also need to work with them. Um, and we need mandates and we need incentives. Um, we need new measures and indicators. We need to get away from the 
the publication madness, the, the pressure to publish at all costs, and that's the only thing that counts. Um, and we need to use those incentives to, to help institutions to, to change their culture. Um, we need data. We need uh, systematically collected data so that we can really see what is happening to, to young researchers. Where are they ending up? Uh, we have this very big macro picture, but we don't know the detail. Um, and that's both qualitative data and quantitative. Um, and all the actors need to work together to affect change. So we need young researchers working with the employers, working with the policy makers, working with the funders, so that all the combined actions add up, add up to this uh, systemic change, as opposed to what we have often at the moment, which is lots of piecemeal activities um, that don't add up to change. They're sort of, we live with the current system and do what we can around it, rather than changing some things that do need to be changed. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, hopefully some of that has, has been useful. Um, and, and we're seeing a discussion if it stimulates any, uh, any questions. Thanks very much.